Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Dr. B, your Creole Connection, coming to you on a beautiful morning in late winter in South Louisiana. Temperature right now is about 74 degrees, and it's expected to get up to about 80 today. On my way to Whitney Plantation, so we just rolled up into the Tonga Battery, and that means we are probably about five miles from Whitney. So here's the Old River Road, and we're facing the levee. You can see some of the signage for a few of the lo local plantation houses. So we have the levee to the left, and sugar cane fields to the right. This, yeah, the good thing about this old river road and these little river towns is that you can pick up some real good plate lunches and we're right in time for that. It's almost noon and you can go into most of these little local restaurants and pick up a good plate of food for a few bucks. So we're going to make a decision here pretty soon on which one of these to visit and see what they have in the skillets today. Here we just pulled into the Whitney Plantation uh, through the front entrance. It seems to be open. Let's go check it out. See a few cars up there. Oh, I think we're in business here, camper. So we're about to start exploring uh, the only plantation in Louisiana that is based on life from a slave's perspective. So here we have a, a blacksmith shop. Blacksmith, some of the, the slaves had significant ironworking skills and they would make implements for the, for the farm. So, standing here in front of this blacksmith shop, the question is, who taught these slaves the skills, uh, ironwork and carpentry and brick making and brick laying? Who taught that? And the answer is, they already knew it. Because when they were taken from their lands and they selected people who had these skills, this was no on the job training. Uh, for the most part. Of course, children born here were taught the skills, but many came here knowing these skills and they passed it down to their children. Plows, knives, hammers, and this is very well restored. And what we have here is a Japanese plum tree. So here are examples of slave quarters. Now these slave quarters were actually built by the slaves themselves of cypress wood. And that's why they're still standing. Cypress is almost like concrete. It just gets better with age. Look at the patina on this facade. At just about all of these exhibits, you have statutes of uh, little slave kids and adults and how they would just move about in daily life. That's pretty unique to this plantation, Whitney. And we can go in and we can look at the walls and ceiling and we can see cracks through the walls, so it was very cold in here during the winter and hot during the summer. An example of a bed. Sometimes multiple families lived in these one or two rooms and the kids would sleep on pallets on the floor. Look at that. So we leave outside of one and 
there's another. I think I read somewhere where there were 22 slave cabins at the height of this plantation's existence. So these big vessels that you see here are actually used in the production of sugarcane. This was a sugarcane plantation and producing sugar was a 24 hour a day production. And what they would do is cut it and clean it and bring it over here to cook it. Round the clock production. And at night they would work by candlelight. Cutting cane in the fields was an interesting proposition. They would have as many as nearly a hundred people cutting cane and they would say, cut high, knock off the tops of the cane, cut low, bring it down to the ground, and then brought to these vats to cook. Ida did a little damage here too. You can see the blue roof in the distance. Now you can see some down trees, including this one. I just heard something rustling in the grass here, other than the wind. I thought you might be able to give you guys a shot of an alligator scurrying about. Not to be, I guess. This is a very interesting exhibit here. It's called the German Coast Uprising. And it's one of the most uh, sophisticated revolts by slaves in the history of this country and the consequences for those for that insurgency for their own freedom was horrific and out of respect for the memories of the statues shown here i'm going to not videotape uh, this exhibit i'm not sure what this is but it's it's quite lovely in the middle of uh, of this field of memories. It's nice. What's what's nice about it is the patina over the years, how it has aged this stone, and it's been allowed to do so. It's really lovely. So this prison here, but this, this is a jail. Many would be fitted into these tiny cells. And just to get the scale of the size of these, of this, uh, these rooms, they are about seven feet tall and about seven feet wide and about seven feet long. Seven by seven by seven. A cube. This is the horror of it all. Just standing in here is emotional. Lovely piece of art here. A slave lifting his hands to glory, free of the shackles that. Found him. You know, a lot of and a lot of blues music and old Negro gospel got has its genesis in these fields here, with people crying out to God for deliverance and just comfort. A memorial of some sort. 3D. You can see the hands reaching out from the captivity and these bondage. As long as the hand is reaching, humanity has to respond in some way. How beautiful is this? So the memorial that we are looking at now is called the Field of Angels, and this memorial honors uh, some 2,200 
enslaved children who died in St. John the Baptist Parish between the uh, ages, between the years of 1823 and 1863, shortly, or during the Civil War. You know, it was disease and harsh labor created these high death rates for these kids, and enslaved mothers suffered tremendously. One, one lady, I was told, uh, a woman by the name of Francois, uh, she was a laundress. She lived on this plantation and lost five children by the age of 23. Life expectancy was very short. Cradling the baby, almost like the Pieta. How moving is that? Random tributes and memorials left for children. Very moving. This memorial is called the Gwendolyn Midlow Hall Mem Memorial. And this was a, one of the researchers who took on this task of researching the family relationships and the people who passed through, not just this plantation, but surrounding ones and actually all around the country, uh, looking at family relationships and the very things that caused that connection from one slave family living in one plantation to another slave fa family living maybe in another state. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a great memorial to a magnificent historian who took on this labor of love to document all of this. This is a memorial. So after you do a walking tour, a self-guided tour, that's nice, you can come here and sit under this canopy and take a rest. So here we're walking up on the kitchen. The kitchen was usually maintained by women who lived uh, in the cabins that we looked at earlier. And they would do cooking here and laundry. And they would cook for the, quote, big house. And the cooking was done out here and here because uh, it presented a fire hazard and it was nice to not have that risk of burning down the big house uh, due to a kitchen fire. You can see the ovens there, fireplace, pots, no insulation, but well-crafted cypress boards. And this place has probably been standing here for 150 years and no rot. Cypress. Cypress Woods has, has that quality. Of course, as we leave the kitchen, it's just a short distance to the big house, which is where we walk into now. I have to get around to the front to take a look at the architecture, but it looks like it, most of them in this region, Greek Revival architecture. The big cistern here. You can see the pipe going from the gutters to the cistern, and water would be harvested. But as I said, look like that functionality has been converted to another source. It looks like a storage closet of some sort. This is the walkway leading to the big house. And as we walk on this path, we can see one of the many statues of a child standing here looking up at the, the house. Maybe thinking 
about owning it one day. So here we have a shot of the big house from about 150 feet from it. It's lined with oak trees as were many of these properties. And as we walk on this heronbone patterned brick pathway, we can look right at the house. But we're walking right up to the front of the big house. And as you can see, I've been walking for a while and we're still, you know, 40 feet from it. And the storm did some damage to the roof, but apparently not enough to have it blue tarped. Maybe some of these shingles need to be replaced. But you can see all of the ironwork, the doors, just beautiful. Oak trees, and there's the canopy behind me. There's definitely a, a lot of romance uh, depicted in these places. Let's go in. And it's cool, and that's because the ceilings are higher and the windows are larger, and there's a cross draft uh, from one door to the other. And it's as far as we can go, but that's okay. You get a good view of what the interior looks like in a lot of these plantation homes. See if we can get in here. I'm always fascinated by the ironwork because all of this is handcrafted. Breakfast nook, anybody? You know, these places look very romantic from the street, but look at the floors. 150 years of wear and a patina that's unbelievable. And here's a view from the side of the house big house with this big oak tree sprawling and groping down to the ground branches that grow so long gravity takes over and they find themselves touching the ground and that my friend is a cypress log and this is what most of these houses are made out of constructed from a cypress chicken coop. Wonder how long that's been standing there. Here you can get a nice shot of what the shingles look like on the roofs. Actual cypress boards. expertly laid. And we're walking toward the front of the Antioch Church. Now, this church is, was greatly impacted by Hurricane Ida. And as you can see, there's tarping on the roof. And from what I understand, it was leaking inside the church before the hurricane, so it's undergoing considerable repairs. So that exhibit is closed. That's unfortunate because inside we've been treated to some of the original furniture, hard antique oak uh, walnut furniture that doesn't require any kind of 
stain, just a good waxing every now and then. And there it is. The Antioch Church. Closed. It's almost worth having a return visit here just to go inside once it's all repaired and take a look inside. Antioch Baptist Church, 1870. During the reconstruction period and after the war. Well, here we are back inside the building, the museum portion, headed out. I want you to take a picture of this particular wall because we're concerned about wealth and capitalism. And I want you to see it from a slave's perspective. It's all about profits, all of it. Here's the store of Whitney Plantation. You can go in here and buy tickets to see the exhibits and even a few snacks on the way out. Heading back to the River Road, so yes, on my way here, I saw a gentleman on the side of the road. He looked like he was selling some type of plate lunch. And I always liked him when I'm in these little rural towns, go in one of these restaurants that are off the beaten paths. Let's see, today being Friday, yeah, it's probably gonna be some kind of jambalaya and sausage, big old tall glass of lemonade, probably. But there's always something else on the side. And I, I love a piece of lemon meringue pie but I haven't been able to find that recently. It's been more of the pecan pie. Uh, well, whatever it is, I'll, I'll take a piece, of, a slice of that. So. so here I am, right outside of, uh, right off of the levee, Donaldsonville going north and Luling going south. And we're gonna eat at Ambrosia's today. We're gonna eat at Ambrosia's. See how it, how it works out. It's old school, I can tell you that right now. So the food from uh, Ambrosius was pretty good. Well, here we are leaving the river parishes and heading back home. And I can tell you, it was an emotional time. It was a lot of the, uh, time spent reflecting. You know, I saw a few people milling about and you could see that they were clearly uh, experiencing some kind of emotion too. And this is all because the exhibits were from the perspective of the slaves themselves, children and adults. And when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes and you can feel some of the things that they were dealing with, it puts a whole new spin on, 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 uh, on what might otherwise be just a typical tour. Well, this is Dr. B, your Creole Connection, and we'll catch you in the next video.